and we're back in the studio. If you've been paying attention, the last several releases have been basically me on the road. Um, so I've just quickly thrown a quick edit together. I think one of them was maybe 10 minutes, the other one maybe seven minutes, and then uh, released it, called it Square. The computer that I have, I bought for uh, before I started doing all this video stuff, The my tablet. So it can't do the high quality, long length type videos that I normally do. So just released a quick edit, plus I was pretty busy. So, But I, in order to make sure I got a release out every Sunday, I put something out that had some value for you guys. But now back home in the studio doing some recording for you guys. And today's topic we're gonna go over is some common issues found with uh, products on rifle builds for long range shooting. Stuff that I have seen in my courses over the last four years that have uh, some commonalities. Now, if you've been here before, thank you for coming back. If you are new, I appreciate you, for co I appreciate you coming. Hopefully you like it. Check it out, go like and subscribe. Make sure you ring the bell so you get notifications. I have people that I get messages from that like and sub, but they don't get notifications at all. So make sure you do that, that helps me out a lot. And if you want to support me, do it by supporting yourself and going down to the links below and getting yourself some things that you may need. Um, I'm gonna leave it vague because YouTube sucks. Anyways, let's go ahead and jump on into this. Please squeeze it like a titty or rotate it like a cock. So one of the first things that I want to go over is, you know, why is this important? So, or where am I speaking from? Regardless of the experience that I have with firearms and shooting and everything, one of the things I started noticing when I started teaching classes was uh, two specific problems. Then this is related to uh, more specifically for like long range rifles or gas guns, precision gas guns. But I've also seen it in some others with uh, like carbine stuff. Um, but two product or two problems with products that uh, a lot of shooters come out and they learn the drawbacks of their setups. Now, the first one we'll talk about is simply stocks. Whether they be collapsible or fixed, they're going to have some of their own problems. Now, I'm speaking specifically from a, an instructor slash shooter standpoint, so something I've seen or some things I've seen cause problems for shooters over time. And one of the most common ones for in relation to stocks is actually the width of the stock. Whether the stock be too thin or too wide, it can throw off the shooter behind the gun in a lot of ways. Now, 
to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about a specific experience with a shooter who had a stock that was way too fat, and it was a uh, Magpul Precision stock. Now, <clears throat> I have some other issues with the stock, which I'll get into, but to explain this is I was trying to get a shooter lined up behind a gun. It was a two-day class, and the entire time, he could not get straight behind the gun. Now, the reason you want to be straight behind the gun is to re is for recoil management. You want to control the recoil recovery to where you want it, right? Pa recoil travels to the path of least resistance. You need to control that so you can keep your side picture on target when you shoot. Now, the entire time, this guy's neck was like this, and it curved into his uh, upper body, his shoulders, and then his from his shoulders to his hips, they got back in line behind the gun. But his neck and shoulders were completely off. And... For a while, I was like, man, is his optic too far forward, too too far back? What is what is going on here? And uh, But that wasn't the issue. I got down behind the gun. If you are, a little caveat, if you're anyone who teaches or anything, <clears throat> you should have a baseline of performance for yourself, understood. So when you get behind a gun to test it, to check it out, it's not just simply to dump rounds out of someone else's gun. That's not it at all. It's so that you can understand the problem that they're having from their perspective based off of a known baseline, which is yourself. All right. So I got down behind his gun and it did the same thing to me. And I looked down at his stock and it was too fat. It was simply pushing my head, his head, away from the gun, from the center line of the gun. So he had to turn his body, his neck, and push his eye forward just to get the proper eye relief, all right? Which meant his entire um, upper body was getting thrown out of alignment. Now, I have seen this a lot with stocks. I should have been making lists over the years um, on the different products, different stocks that do this. I didn't, it's something I thought about. I've even had a couple students like, well, I don't want this anymore. And they had an extra or I gave them mine and they just gave me their messed up stock. So I have a box somewhere full of messed up stocks. Um, and oftentimes I'll have a like a B5 SOP mod or B5 um, Bravo stock or whatever, and I'll just give them that and I'll pull from whatever I have later on so that they can have the best learning experience possible, which the learning experience slash product thing I'll get into in a little bit. Now, what is that? problem look like if the stock is too thin. Now recently I had a shooter come out with a uh, 30-06 Ruger American uh, bolt gun, right? And it was in a traditional style plastic stock. And man, I, that, that stock was like super thin. It was ridiculous. And uh, what I noticed with him is he could have proper eye relief. His eye was lined up behind the the gun but his face wasn't touching at all it didn't help also that he had a very narrow chin but uh, what it meant is he was getting his eye behind the gun obviously it wasn't consistent which meant shots were gonna be off however he could get a full sight picture without his face ever touching the gun because it was too thin but what happened is if he pushes his face to the gun he then had to cant his head to get his eye in behind the optic in order to get a field of view when he was touching it that's a, that causes a problem as well. Now, you know, the, it's been taught for generations, basically, to get a proper stock weld, stock weld, stock weld. Um, come to find out, it's not stock weld that you need. It's consistent point of contact. So whatever platform you're shooting, whatever you're doing with it, have a consistent point of contact, not necessarily stock weld. So it's, it could be here, here, depending on your face, depending on your stock, rifle combo. It can be a bunch of different places. But you need that consistent point of contact, uh, constantly or yeah, consistently behind the gun. Now, that's both the too fat and too narrow. The too narrow thing, like, it's a really big problem. And one of the things I noticed on this was because he wasn't getting consistent uh, placement on the stock, wasn't even touching it, and the design of the rifle itself, when he would press the trigger. He didn't have as much control over that gun as he should, and there was a couple times it was close to getting scope bit, which I want to make it very clear. Getting scope bit, which if you don't know what it means, it basically means when you shoot your reticle or your reticle, your optic comes back and hits you in the eye, right? You can find probably hundreds of videos online of people doing this to others on purpose because they think it's funny. It's not fucking funny. 
it's actually a really stupid thing to do. Not only can that cut down into the bone and leave serious scars and uh, traumas to your eye, um, but it's an incredibly irresponsible thing to do. So a lot of people do this as a joke. They'll set someone up that has no idea, they're trusting in another person to know better, and they'll set, they be set up to get scope bit, so now they're just bleeding and gushing everywhere. Well, let me make this clear to you. It's irresponsible, it's dangerous. You just became a bad representation slash ambassador for a, a gun community. You introduce someone to firearms in a dangerous way and probably brush them off of it for the rest of their life, which is a very common thing to happen. And you showed negligence as a teacher. You showed a uh, bad representation of what getting behind the gun and being responsible actually means and a whole list of other things. It's not funny, it's not right. You should not be doing it. And honestly, you should be condoning it every time you see it and stopping it from happening. It's the same thing as giving someone a pistol of too large a caliber that has no idea what they're doing and just thinking it's funny because it'll recoil, they drop it, get hit with it, whatever. It's a bad thing to do. Now, jumping back into the training side, another problem with stocks is how long or short they are. Um, so a good example of this is the Magpul PRS stock that you can put on your precision gas guns. Now I am 5'8 and 19 inches across. I am the average height and width of a human in the world. So the way I think about this is if you make, if a company makes a stock that at its most collapse can't even fit a shooter of my stature, you're wrong. That's, that's wrong because you're not building a stock to fit the majority of people that are out there. Now, not only is this a good place to start because then you can either, you can make that your midpoint where it works for the average person and it collapses a little further or extends further. So now you have a good midpoint to start off of, which there is a handful of stocks out there that um, do that correctly and wrong, not just the Magpul PRS stock, but that's probably the most widely known one that um, people will recognize me talking about. And I have one. Um, it's on one of my favorite guns and I leave it there because it looks cool. Actually, I like the weight behind it because it mitigates recoil a lot. Um, and it's an effective stock, except for the length and how fat it is. It has a really fat cheek piece that pushes my face away too. Anyway, now at its most collapse, I can't get a proper position behind the gun, which means in every position I get behind the gun, whether it be in the prone, standing, unsupported, or up on a barricade or whatever on a tripod, I am out of alignment behind the gun. My optic would have to be for, uh, further back than it really should be and it's going to throw me off because now my hands, my my arm, my uh, strong hand, my support hand are out of alignment. It's blading my shoulder, which means my sight picture is gonna be off whenever I press shots. I don't have as much control as I need or I want. That want to me is a need. Anyway, which causes problems. So what do I do? Like I obviously strongly recommend B5 Precision Stocks. The, uh, the reason why is because of their adaptability, right? So don't mind the colors. The only thing that this stock lacks compared to like a precision bolt gun stocks is this doesn't cant left or right, which would be really nice if they did. And the cheek piece doesn't cant left or right, which depending on the design and how they would do it, this, it can't really because you got a buffer tube. However, uh, the things that are really nice about this is the you can extend your length of pull quite a bit and you can adjust it based off of where your stock is actually sitting on your buffer tube. And then you can adjust the height of your cheek riser. Now, I sell these stocks on my site. It's not meant to be a plug, but this is the reason why. is because you can use them for so many different types of shooting. Now, I've had the problem before that was easy to solve where, okay, why... I sell the short cheek pieces because they work no matter what gun you got. And I don't want sh uh, shooters to have a problem. But then I ran into a problem before where my face was sitting on the edge here. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? How do I fix that? Well, simply I, well, I brought this in one. All right. That's probably really too far in for what I want. And then I extended this out as much as I could. And then I dialed it in. So my face sat 
right here in the middle. So I found a middle adjustment on the buffer tube instead of, so like a lot of people will do this, they'll have this collapsed all the way in and they'll find their length of pull behind their gun just like that and leave it there. Well, for me, that put my face too much on that edge. So I brought it in one click like I just showed, I believe my natural position's right here. And then I extend this out to make it so my face slides from here to back there, which is all the way extended. And then I don't have that problem anymore. The width of this is perfect for, uh, for a majority of people's eyes to get behind the optic. Uh, this is no shit. I think this is funny every time. Uh, whenever I have shooters that have stock problems in a scope rifle essentials or advancement or even LPVO course, they have stock problems. I'll be like, hey, hop up, go hop on my gun and check it out, get behind it. And no shit, a handful of times stu students will look up, look at me and say, wow. That's a lot better. I was like, yeah, it eliminates all the problems that they're having. Um, the issues that a bad stock position weapon setup, which I'll get into, or um, just bad product can give you are, I'm not gonna say intolerable, but they're unreasonable to have to deal with in regards to what is available out there today. Now, let's go on to the next one, optics. Stocks and optics are the two biggest things. Uh, optics is probably the biggest. Now, I get a lot of shooters that will bring out, well, first of all, my two class types, the scope rifle advancement and essentials course, any optic or any magnification, any rifle is what you can bring. Absolutely. And I'm going to teach you how to run it. However, there is a trend in every shooter that comes out that has certain products or weapon setup or uh, product selection that uh, feature product selected with the certain features they have that they, they run into specific issues. First one let's talk about is weapon setup. If you don't have your firearm properly set up to you, then it's going to cause a range of issues that to the, to those who don't know as much, they're going to think that the problem lies within the product. It's simply not true. A majority of products are actually going to be designed, especially optics these days, are going to be designed to do really well if the weapon's set up right. Now, let's take this for example. This is a Vortex 1 to 10, and it is widely regarded as a terrible eye box. However, I've never had eye box problems with it, or other 1 to 10s that I've shot on a, a couple different guns. And the simple reason was it was set up properly so that when the gun is brought up to my shoulder and I'm shooting, my eye is in the perfect position to be behind the optic with a full field of view, even at 10 power, which this is right now, <clears throat> because of the weapon setup. When you start setting this up, and this is a video I might do in the future, like something really in depth, but if the weapon's set up properly, before the optics ever even thrown on. And then you put the optic on and you fine tune it to where you want to be first by where it's sitting on the rail back and forth and then sliding the optic forward and back in the tube or in the tube in the scope mounts to get it perfect. You're not going to have a lot of issues at all. Um, especially when you have this set up properly, right? Good stock. Now the other issue beyond that becomes to whether shooters are shooting minute or BDC reticles, okay? BDC reticles with minute turrets or even BDC reticles with mill turrets cause a lot of problems for shooters because they're doing two different things. Now, depending on, start with the turrets first, depending on the turret style, some turrets are meant to dial like this. Now this optic is mainly for holding over, but you can dial if needed. But depending on the turret style, they're not meant to dial or anything, just set to zero and use all in the optics, which is fine. However, for a lot of uh, different types of shooting, especially for shooters that come to the course courses and they start learning different things that they can do, they realize like the turrets are holding them back from being able to be more capable. Then you go from that to your reticle choice. Reticle choice is 
it's wildly important because that is your interface to your terrain and your environment, to your target with your system. And if you don't have a good interface, everything that all the information you're going to try to discern from downrange is going to be really, really whack. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you have a reticle without a Christmas tree and you're trying to hold over, you shoot, miss, hold over, it's going to be even less accurate because you're holding over in space. If you're using a bullet drop compensating reticle BDC, I have a whole video on it you can check out. What you're going to have is big issues because unless you have the barrel length, which is going to give you your different velocity for your round, matching to your, um, your bullet drop compensating reticle, then that whole reticle is off anyways. And now you have to shoot in a different style. Those reticles, however they can, they can be effective in certain circumstances, but they also do require you to train a lot more and they require certain logistics behind them that you want to have locked in, in my opinion. And again, I got a video on that. You can check that out. So I'm not going to go fully into it. However, I've had a number of students that'll come out with BDC reticles. I'll, so, I'll show them, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get you set up on this and this is how it's going to work. So we do that, but I also tell them, but also this is what else you can do with these type of optics. So with mill, with mill turret that you can dial and mill reticle that you can hold, this is what else you could be capable of if you had this and this is how much more refined of a shooter you can be. And a number of times I've had shooters go home, come back the next days with a swapped optic or they'll borrow one from someone else because it gets into learning experience, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Now, I could give, I don't know, maybe I'll give a, a list on the website for the classes on different um, optics that are recommended, but it's not something I'm going to do right now. However, and that's personally because as an instructor, I believe you should be able to teach everything. If you have a student that comes out with something, you should be able to teach it to them. Show them what's up, show them how to do it. And uh, it's kind of a point of pride slash uh, a level of expertise that I believe an instructor should have. But also, they're going to, a lot of people will come out with just what they have. Maybe they can't afford more and they want to know, they need to know how to do it with their gun as successfully as possible. Well, that's what I'm going to give you. Um, I'm not going to say, hey, you can only come out with this type of product or this type of reticle or this type of whatever simply because that's all I want to teach. I don't believe in that. Um, curriculum specific things is different. Two of my curriculums for long range are very much designated for any magnification, any rifle uh, for that reason. Now, another problem is optic height so or mount height. Depending on the type of shooting you're doing, which even if it's long range, it should be very positional. Uh, yes, prone is really good to know. It's really good to do, especially quite a bit, but you should be shooting positional a lot. You do not want your optics super high or super low. You want them somewhere in the middle that befits you. I have optics of different heights. Actually, I think these two are the same. Yeah, these two are the same. Depending on what I'm doing, uh, these two rifle or that rifle is for it's a competition gun for quantified performance, which is extremely positional. So it's a little higher than I would generally like, just a little bit generally like for prone. However, it is perfectly high enough for basically every other position that I have to get into. So that's what I use it for. This is more of a fighting gun, which I shoot upright a lot. So it is an amount that is a little higher but i can still get down behind it in the prone if i have to and to me that is really important to be able to have i have other guns that are more precision based like bolt guns that are mounted a little lower um, simply because of the style of rifle they are and a majority of the types of shooting that i do with them now there are a lot of different mounts out there in the world that you can get different heights for however say you can't get a more honestly more expensive high dollar mount with a certain height, you can get risers. I uh, just saw Reptilia has risers now, Scalaworks has risers. I have one on another rifle that I think is fantastic and it rises my uh, EOTech to the perfect height for me. Um, so those are options you can choose. Now, the third thing I see, which is not something I'm gonna get too deep into, is triggers. Triggers become an issue for some shooters.
To give you a quick example is I look at a lot of products not just as their capability to be able to do what I need effectively, efficiently, easily, and eliminate a lot of problems I might have, but also as how do they teach the shooter? How do they um, relay, or excuse me, if a shooter knows how, how do they relay the information to the shooter that they may need? So a really good example is triggers. Let's take a standard mil spec trigger. A standard mil spec trigger, they're kind of heavy, right? So they're really good at teaching the control that a shooter needs to have behind a gun. However, you can get to a point, I had a shooter in one of my last classes who his control and his capability was such that his mil spec trigger was now holding him back from progressing further, becoming faster in split times, more accurate, and uh, having more control with something that is lighter like this Geisley SSAE. Now, the same thing can be said in reverse. If a shooter does not have the type of control and experience that they need on a trigger, and they buy something that's super smooth and, uh, well, high speed, whatever you want to call it, it can give them a false sense of capability, and what, the, what ends up happening is I'll watch them and they have less control than they need, they have less um, discernment in where their trigger is, and a lot of times they end up slapping and just running that trigger way too fast, or not too fast, uh, too sloppily, so to speak. And they're not learning what it has to teach them. Another example of this will relate is if you're shooting 308 versus a 6.5 at distance. 308 is going to teach you a lot more about position, a lot more about wind than a 6.5 will, simply because um, and recoil simply because of the difference of those platforms. It's the same thing with these. Now, if you have a optic and stock and trigger that's all good and it's good for where you are, that's excellent. The next thing you need to do obviously is train, but then it's how are you doing that? It needs to be with a purpose. Have a goal in mind. Every curriculum I have has a purpose, has a goal in mind that I am trying to get you to. And I believe very much that if you are going out to shoot slash train specifically, you need to do that. To summarize everything I just went over essentially is I look at different products and different builds as what they can teach me as a shooter slash instructor versus what they can do to help me teach shooters. And bad products are a really good teaching lesson for me but also for shooters when they, but they have to have something to show them what's right. So a lot of times I'll toss off my gun here, check this out, see what this feels like, so you can get a better idea. And that's a technique that I use quite a lot. Um, so make sure that if you aren't sure on a product, email someone, message, go to Reddit forums, ask, uh, watch YouTube videos, go to your local store, see it, or call them first, it's easier. Call them, do you have this in stock? Go check it out, get a, get a good idea. Um, that's one thing that I think is a big advantage of today's world versus what it used to be. Uh, you can check out a lot of those things first. I only select products to sell on the site that I know work not just well for myself, but I've seen work extremely well for a wide variety of shooters. And that's not just when it comes to reliability, but can they get behind a gun properly, right? Do they have a good interface? This, this piece of equipment here, right here, attached to your platform, is so wildly important to what you do as a shooter that if you don't pick it carefully or deliberately, so to speak, then it's going to mess up a lot of things you do and it can hold you back. So make sure that you're picking something right. I strongly recommend mill turrets, mill reticle. It gives you a lot more capability uh, as long as you as a shooter are doing your job. And then uh, triggers. Th those three things are really important. But honestly, it a lot of it is stocks and optics that I've noticed a huge difference in. Uh, or yeah, a huge difference in shooters capability as far as whether it limits them or allows them to flourish. So again, just my thoughts. You can think something different. If you do drop them down below, I'd love to hear it. I appreciate you for coming and checking out the channel again. Things are gearing up. I'm getting ready to put down some dates for 2025 and 2026. I'm going to be shifting things. So all training is taking place in a six month block of the year so that I can 
do other stuff for the other six months, which I'll get into at another time. However, there's going to be quite a bit of training in that time, and it's going to be in places like Washington State, looking at Pennsylvania, uh, going back to Montana, to Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, and possibly in the Southwest as well. So make sure to check those out and the website. I appreciate you guys for coming back and checking out the channel. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, drop them down below. I always like checking those out. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, get out and bang. If you are still here, one thing I'd like to chat about real quick is toxicity in your life. Now, that is a wide, wildly used term these days, right? However, when you eliminate toxicity in your life and you eliminate the traits slash habits in yourself that you recognize to be toxic and then you see it, coming towards you or around you, it makes a big difference in how you respond. It makes a big difference to where your energy is in your life. Talking shit, gossip, inserting yourself in places that you don't have any business being in, or just throwing random words out there because you want to. I, when it comes to that, I always remember fools speak because they have to say something. Wise men speak because they have something to say two very different concepts and I do my best to eliminate it in my life to keep it out of my life and to not become that in other people's lives because I want to be of value and add to people's lives and I expect the same so when I recognize that there is toxicity in my life and it it shines bright and I do not engage with it but there are some instances where you might have to, depending on whatever situation. It could be family that you have, you're holding in your life because of some beliefs you may have or business, whatever. So when it comes to that is I choose to engage only when necessary and only in a certain manner of way so that um, I don't fall to the level that I am trying to stay away from. Now, it can be very difficult and it can be very exhausting. Um, I know for me, when something like that comes around my life, it zaps all the energy right out of me and I feel motionless for days. So if that's something that uh, you're recognizing in your life or maybe you're recognizing from yourself, some things that you can do to help is set boundaries. Say, hey, I'm not going to engage in that conversation. Or hey, you, you guys go ahead, I'm gonna take a step out. Or if there's someone that's continuously bringing that towards you and for whatever reason you may have, you're not cutting them from your life, you can set the boundary of, hey, I'm only gonna engage with you on this level or about this thing or in this time because we have this thing going on and you can give them whatever reason you need to to preserve yourself. Um, and in some ways, I mean, I've had this battle, it can seem selfish towards others, but there's a I don't know how to explain this well, but in my opinion, there's a good kind of selfish and there's a bad kind of selfish. And the good kind of selfish is, it's this. I need to have fuel in my tank in order to reach you where you are. And if I don't have fuel in my tank to reach you, what's the point in me trying to be there for you? I can't get to you anyways. So making sure that you take care of yourself first is the priority and then others around you. Obviously there are moments, there are times, and there are situations where you have to forego yourself and do what you can for those close to you. And I'm all about that too. No, there's no right answer for every single situation. It's very Machiavellian, so to speak. You must pick what is best at the time. So that's what I got for this week. Make sure you check out next week's video. I'm going to try to do something on the last several weeks of training, throw a bunch of stuff together for the last courses, and I hope you get out and bang.